Hello, my Bill 5000 Nation. How's everyone doing today? Hopefully, everyone's having a great day. If not, I hope it gets better from here. All right, we are back with a new Mr. Ballin video. That's right. This one is titled, uh, The Devious Mission the Government Tried to Hide. Probably one of a thousand, but, you know, that's another story for another time. All right, let's go ahead and get in the story. Go ahead, turn them lights down low, put on something comfy, cut up with something special. <sighs> let's get uh, probably horrified. Let's get horrified. Yeah, that, sound, that sounds appropriate. Yeah. There are many truly unbelievable stories that have come from World War II, from heroes performing superhuman feats on the battlefield to unspeakable tragedies that occurred at massive scale. These stories, for better or worse, are part of our collective human history, and so today they're shared widely. But there is one story from World War II that doesn't get talked about very much, and it doesn't really make any sense because one, it's totally fascinating, and two, it is quite possibly the most influential singular event that happened in the entire war. And so today I'm gonna share that story, and at the end of it, if you've never heard this before, very likely you're gonna go on Google and look this up because it oh, sounds God. more like a fictional movie plot than real life. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story yeah. format, then you come to the right place because that's- That's great. Everyone, Google's gonna explode because I will Damn it. It's all we do, and we upload once a week. So, if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button lets you look through their prized 1970s family photo album, Make sure you aggressively lick your finger and flip the pages each time so you smudge all the edges. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, well, let's get into today's story. Oh, today's story is going to be wild. I have a feeling that Google is going to explode from everyone getting on here trying to figure out what the hell he's talking about. On the morning of April 30th, 1943, a fisherman named Jose Antonio Rey Maria rowed his little boat out into the rough waters of the Atlantic Ocean just off the coast of Spain. Jose was a sardine spotter, which meant his job was to go out into the ocean and look down and try to find schools of sardines swimming about 20 feet below the surface, and then he would flag the other fishermen over who would scoop the fish up with their nets. And Jose was very good at his job. In fact, he was quite possibly the best sardine spotter in the whole village of Punta Umbria, which is a small fishing village in southwestern Spain where Jose was from. But on this particular day, the weather wasn't quite great, the water was kind of murky and choppy, and so Jose wasn't seeing any sardines. But as Jose was starting to feel frustrated, he looked out and on the surface of the water, pretty far away from him, he saw this strange object floating on the surface. And at first he assumed it had to be maybe some dead sea animal that had floated to the surface. But as he stared at it from his boat that was rocking in the water, he saw between waves, there was a yellow color on this lump that just looked kind of unnatural. And so feeling curious about whatever this was, Jose decided to start rowing over in that direction and get a I don't know if I'd be rowing over in that direction to get a better look at it. Oh. Why, why is there something yellow on it? Could it be a person? Is it a person? Better look. And as he got closer and closer, he realized that yellow color was unnatural. The yellow was part of a life jacket, which meant this was a person floating in the ocean. Oh, and shit. so Jose, with his it heart racing, was thinking- It is a person. That face, yeah. Thinking, oh my gosh, I have to go save this person. And so he raced over right up alongside them. And as soon as he looked down, he realized it was obviously too late. This person was obviously deceased. Oh, it was shit. a man who had a military trench coat on who was lying face down in the water. And so Jose reached into the water and rolled the guy over and immediately he was hit with this horrible smell and then he looked at the face of this dead person and Zombie. was horrified. The guy's eyes Zombie experimentation. 
eyes were sunken into his skull. He had mold growing on his chin. You know, bones were exposed. And it almost looked like the dead guy's face was trapped in this kind of ghastly expression as if the last thing he experienced was horrifying before he died. And then Jose noticed there was something else about this corpse. That's not, it's zombies. It's zombies. It's zombie experimentation. There was a chain wrapped around his wrist, and that chain extended deep into the water. And so Jose grabbed the chain and began reeling it back in, and eventually he pulled out this big black briefcase that had a code on the top of it that you would need to enter in order to open it. Now, for context, at this time in Europe, World War II was raging from Britain to Russia. Sorry. And so there were literally thousands of dead corpses scattered all over the world, basically, around the areas where fighting was taking place. So at this time, finding a dead soldier floating out in the middle of the ocean this is a was Tuesday. actually not that uncommon. But just a fucking Tuesday. Yeah, but just a Tuesday. But in Spain, where Jose was, this was uncommon because Spain had not entered World War II. They were a neutral country. And so because there was oh, no fighting well, happening shit. there, there should not have been any dead soldiers floating just off their coastline. And so Jose stared transfixed at this dead soldier in his briefcase. Hey, there's dead people over. Ah, it's just Tuesday. Wait. No, we're neutral. This ain't normal. Oh God, it's a weird day, people. For a couple more moments, and then he kind of broke out of it and turned and yelled to the other fishermen who were out there in another boat and tried to flag them over to help get this corpse out of the water. But the other fishermen, when they realized what Jose was asking them to do, they said, no, we're not helping you with that. We're not touching the dead body. And so Jose just grabbed the dead body with one arm and then awkwardly with his other arm, he managed to row this boat and drag along this corpse all the way back to the beach. And as he did, he and the other fishermen were kind of yelling back and forth at each other. It was kind of a commotion on the water. And so by the time Jose had got the corpse back to shore and dragged it up onto the sand, villagers in Punta Umbria had heard the commotion and come outside to see what was going on. Uh -oh. And they saw Jose standing there with this dead body. And so they began forming a crowd around the body. And so nearby, Spanish soldiers were doing a training exercise and they saw this crowd gathering on the beach and so a group of them walked over to see what was just so happens ain't that just how it always happens it just so happens Lee going on and they pushed through the crowd and they saw this dead body on the ground and right away they began searching the dead body to figure out who it was not a real photo but a commercial yeah. last night I got a call from a random Nigerian phone number and so of course I answered it, yeah. and unbelievably, it was the prince of Nigeria. And <laughs> if I just got him a few gift cards, he'd make me rich. Are you kidding me? What a deal! And so seconds later, me and old Seagull Lung were down at the ATM withdrawing every last cent from our bank accounts. But as we stood there laughing excitedly about all the sports cars and diamonds we were going to get with our newfound wealth, this middle-aged homeless electric eel named Horace slithered up to us and he said, guys, you're being scammed. The Nigerian prince isn't real. And he said he knew this because he had fallen for this scam too. That was how he became homeless. Turns out it's actually quite easy for scammers like this fake Nigerian prince to buy your personal information, like your phone number, your birth date, your family members, all that from data brokers. And then unless you are a literal genius and can spot a scam call while it's happening, you too could become a victim. Or you could just sign up for Aura and not have to worry about any of this. Aura is a service that identifies which data brokers are selling your personal information to these scammers and they will reach out on your behalf and have that information removed. Boom, done. Aura also protects against online threats with parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. So you can either let people continue to exploit and profit off of your private information, or you can go to Aura.com slash Mr. Ballin to start your two-week free trial now. Okay, back to the story. 
two week free trial people give it a shot and that when the fit. Spanish soldiers found his identification papers, they learned that his name was William Martin and he was a major in the British Royal Marines. Also on these papers, it said that Major Martin was assigned to the Combined Operation Headquarters in London, which the Spanish soldiers knew was an outpost that organized commando raids on Nazi-held territory. Under Major Martin's military trench coat, when the soldiers opened it up, they saw he was dressed in full kit, full battle gear, which suggested he had died during one of these commando raids. But after the Spanish soldiers had removed his gear, they couldn't find any shrapnel wounds or gunshot wounds. And so the running theory was, you know, he must have been flying over this area and maybe his plane was shot down. And that's why we can't figure out how he died. But the Spanish soldiers had not heard any reports of a plane being shot down right off the coast. And so really... Maybe the water drug. We don't know. Really, they had no idea how Major Martin actually came to be here. Then, it one of weird. these Spanish soldiers who was still searching Major Martin's pockets found in one of them some crumpled papers and a photograph. And after he looked at them, he tapped on his commanding officer's shoulder and showed him. The photo was black and white, and it was this pretty young woman, and on the back of it, it was signed Pam. As for the crumpled papers that had been near this photo, they were bills. One was from a London nightclub from three nights earlier, and the other was a receipt for a diamond engagement ring. Now, these Spanish soldiers were not Aww. overly emotional, but they couldn't help but think how kind of sad it was that, you know, Major Martin obviously was in love with this woman Pam, and they must have just gotten engaged, and now he's dead. It's like a tragic love story. And so the soldier who had found yeah. these bills and this photo folded them back up and tucked them. Is it a cipher or a code or something? Not actual shit? Back inside of Major Martin's pockets. And then the soldiers talked about what they should do next. Now, technically, because Spain was a neutral country, mm -hmm. what they were supposed to do was turn this body back over to the British because he was a British soldier. But the Spanish government was run by a fascist dictator, Francisco Franco, who was not really neutral at all. He was actually secretly aligned with the Nazis. In fact, the Nazis' leader, Adolf Hitler, had helped Franco come to power, and so now that he was in power, he regularly shared secrets with the Germans. He's and so shit. when these Spanish Spanish soldiers eventually contacted their higher-ups to ask what to do with this dead British soldier, their superiors told them, do not give Major Martin's body back to the British. Instead, bring his body to a nearby morgue where agents who worked for Franco would be able to inspect the body and open up that briefcase and see what was inside. And so these Spanish soldiers did as they were told. And when yeah. Franco's agents were able to finally pop open that black briefcase that was connected to Major Martin's wrist, they discovered inside three letters from leaders of the British military. And when Franco's agents read these letters, they knew right away they had discovered something incredible. And within days, these letters were sitting right on Adolf Hitler's desk. Now, at this time, oh, in fuck. April of 1943, Hitler was starting to worry that he was about to lose the war. Even though the Nazis had successfully conquered most of Europe, it felt like the tide was turning against them. And in Hitler's mind, it was starting to seem likely that the Americans and the British were poised to launch some sort of massive attack on Nazi-controlled territory, and if they weren't ready for it, I mean, this could cost them the war. But Hitler had no idea where this major Allied attack was going to happen. And so trying to figure that out was basically the biggest priority the Nazis had at the time. Now, most of Hitler's intelligence suggested that this big major Allied attack was going to take place on Sicily, which is an Italian island. Italy was allied with the Nazis, and Nazi spies who were monitoring British and American phone conversations were hearing lots of chatter about an invasion of Sicily, and so that's why they believed yeah. that's gotta be the place. That's where the attack's gonna happen. Okay. But when Hitler looked at these three letters that were found inside of Major Martin's briefcase, everything changed. 
The letters, which were all signed by top leaders of the British military, said that the plans to attack Sicily were actually fake, that British and American forces were talking on these obviously tapped phone lines. They knew the Nazis were listening. They were talking on these lines about this invasion oh. of Sicily just to confuse the Nazis. They wanted the Nazis to think that Sicily is the place. But, as these letters would go on to explain, the real place, the real location of this huge Allied attack was going to be Nazi-controlled Greece, so 500 miles away. And so as Hitler is reading this, you know, he's terrified because in his mind, he always thought Greece was really the Nazis' weakest link. And so to get this intelligence, it was the equivalent of like winning the lottery. Suddenly, Hitler went from having no idea where this huge attack on him was going to Fucking be to knowing exactly where it was going to be and knowing that he would have the time to shore up his weakest link, Greece. And so, on May 12th, 1943, less than two weeks after Jose the Sardine Spotter found Major Martin's body floating off the coast of Punta Umbria, Hitler sent a military directive to all of his leaders to prepare for a huge Allied attack, not on Sicily, but on Greece. And before long, German tanks were rumbling from southern France to Greece, and tens of thousands of German soldiers were setting up barriers on Greek beaches to repel the invasion. And then out at sea, the famous German U-boats, their submarines, which were so deadly during World War II, were out all over the place, getting ready to shoot any Allied ships that came towards the shore. In short, the Nazis were ready. But by July 9th, so two months later, nothing had happened. There had been no major Allied attack on Greece, on Sicily, or anywhere else for that matter. Meanwhile, back in Sicily on July 9th, one of the few soldiers who was still stationed there, because remember, all those soldiers had been pushed to Greece, one of the few remaining soldiers was in his bunk writing a letter to his mother, and he would detail that it just felt too quiet in Sicily. And after he had written this letter, signed it, and put it away, he heard outside a massive booming sound. And so he ran outside, and he looked in horror towards the horizon. Now, instead of being a beautiful clear blue, it was black with smoke and warships as far <laughs> as the eye could see. He couldn't even count the number of warships on the horizon. And they were all coming right towards Sicily, firing their cannons and guns. This was the big Allied attack. It was on Sicily. The few soldiers in Sicily who came out of their bunkers and looked out and saw this knew right away that they were so ridiculously outnumbered that there was absolutely no hope. And so the soldier who had just written to his mother about how calm it seemed here, along with several others who was standing near him, they immediately just took off their uniforms and ran. And soon the other soldiers on the island began coming out of their cover and seeing they were under attack. And most of them did the same thing. Everybody basically ran away. And so the British and the Americans that were coming on warships barely had to fight. They took over Sicily incredibly easily, and within a few weeks, the oh. Allies had complete control over the island, and the Italian government had been overthrown. Hitler had thought the secret intelligence he had found inside of Major Martin's briefcase would help him win the war. But in reality, those letters actually proved to be the beginning of the end for the Nazis. It would turn out Major William Martin, the dead British soldier that Jose the Sardine Spotter found off the coast of Punta Umbria, Spain, was not really who he appeared to be. In reality, Major William Martin didn't exist. The body definitely existed. That was a real dead body, but the identification of the body was fake. It had been fabricated by two very smart British intelligence officers named Ewan Montague and Charles Chumley as part of their very famous operation called Operation Mincemeat. And this operation was truly one of a kind. It was designed entirely to trick Hitler. The Allies knew if they dropped a dead British soldier off the coast of Spain, a neutral country, that they would turn it over to the Germans. That's and that's exactly what happened. And so this everything that was on moment. the fake major Dude, that's that's a complete learnable moment. Trick your enemy. 
it's fucking awesome. his body from the trench coat to the kit he was wearing to the identification papers the receipts the photos all of it was placed very intentionally to convince the germans that major martin was real Major Martin was given a high enough military rank that it kind yeah. of made sense that he might be carrying this really special briefcase with highly classified military secrets, but his rank was not high enough that he would be known in military circles because that would make it too easy for the Germans to identify that this was fake. And for the same reason, Montague and Chumley gave their fake major a very common name, Bill Martin. There were loads of Martins in the British military at the time, making a fake one hard to spot. But the British intelligence officers knew that they couldn't just present this kind of basic, generic British soldier and trick the entire German military. They needed to give him a backstory. And so Chumley and Montague spent as much time on Major Martin's uniform and what he was wearing as they did on his fake love <laughs> affair with Pam. Montague and Chumley had oh, a woman fuck. on their staff write these phony love letters to Major Martin, pretending to be Pam, and she wrote in beautiful, curling penmanship, talking about how difficult it was to be in love with him during a war. And then also, Chumley and Montague got that receipt for the diamond engagement ring, along with uh, the nightclub receipt from just a couple of days great. earlier, and they tucked that into his pocket, really making it feel like this tragic love story. <laughs> And so it was a combination of all of these details that have been thought through so carefully by these intelligence officers Great. that really made Major <laughs> Martin seem 100% real. It's the little things. It, it is. It's the little things. As for the real identification of the dead body, it belonged to a 34-year-old homeless man from London named Aww. Glendor Michael. Michael had lived this wretched, miserable life and then eventually died when he ate rat poison that was on a piece of bread. We don't know if he tried to kill himself or if it was accidental. Michael's body had been stored in a refrigerator in a morgue unclaimed for months when Montague and Chumley found out about him and decided he would be perfect because no one would notice if his body went missing. And so that's, ultimately, Operation Mincemeat... That's fucked up. I mean, that's smart. That's smart. That's fucked up. But the... Me. Smart. was a massive success. Hitler completely mistook a homeless man from London for a relatively high-ranking British military officer carrying international secrets on his wrist, and it cost Hitler the war. Glendor Michael may have lived a wretched life and died in absolute hey, he's a agony, hero. but in death, he helped, is a fucking hero. helped defeat the Nazis. Today, there is a marker on Glendor Michael's grave in Spain that actually denotes him as an official British military officer. As for Montague and Chumley, they were quickly promoted after Operation Mincemeat and then ultimately became famous for their plot. So that's gonna do it. If you got something out of today's story oh, and you want to hear more like it, be sure to check- Go clap. Yeah! That was great. That was amazing. That was... Oh, that was fucking awesome. Operation Mincemeat. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> I laughed. I cried. Oh, all right. If you all enjoyed today's video as much as I did, please leave a thumbs up. If you're a fan of the spooky, scary, strange, strange, think about subscribing. As always, be good to one another. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Wow. Some tomfoolery. What won the war? Tomfoolery. Homeless people.